It is my great privilege and pleasure to be having a conversation with the CEO and chairman of State Street, Ron O'Hanley. Um, and I'm just going to uh, embarrass him by making a few comments about his, give a little bit of his bio before we get started uh, and get into this conversation. But just to give you some context for his background, um, joined State Street in 2015, was a COO before becoming uh, the, pre the CEO in uh, 2019 was previously with uh, Fidelity Investments and also Bank of New York Mellon. I know it's BNY now, but I have to say the full name. <laughs> uh, McKinsey before that. And but I think also just for real you know, grounding in this particular conversation, he's been involved with numerous efforts focused on climate action, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, governance, corporate governance, of course. We shouldn't forget about that. Currently leading the Sustainable Markets Initiative Task Force for Asset Managers and Asset Owners. That is a mouthful. But also involved with the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, which you heard about uh, a little while ago. Um, focusing capital on the long term and the Vatican Summit on the Just Transition. So great background in both, both of the worlds we're talking about here um, this week. And I'm so honored to have you here. Thank you. Uh, please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I don't think State Street needs much introduction. It's uh, one of the world's la largest asset managers and, of course, custodian banks. Um, they're part of the Net Zero Asset Managers Alliance. And that means you've got both operational goals uh, towards net zero for your own operations for 2050, but also, especially important for this crowd, where are the investments going to help make this transition happen? Um, what we'd like to explore some of the specific instruments and policies that State Street is using, uh, starting with with one of the things um, that I know you're pointing to in your own, in your language um, on your website and, and other strategy materials that you publish, which is this this tool of active engagement. Right? How can um, this really be a tool? And can you provide some some concrete examples of success in, in ways you've used this to to help make that, that happen. Sure, Heather, and, and thanks for, uh, for inviting me. It's really good to be here. It's a very important time for this discussion. Um, as we think about investing, we've got almost $4 trillion in assets under management. Much of that is invested in so-called passive funds. And if you think about passive funds, they're the closest thing to permanent capital in the public markets. <laughs> right? as, as long as a company is in the index, we're going to be invested in it. And that puts a very important responsibility on us as the asset manager because we can't sell out of the, of the company. You know, I can't say that, you know, I really don't like this company and the S&P 500 is now the S&P 499, right? It just doesn't work that way. So stewardship has always been a very important part, uh, or certainly in, over the last 10, 15 years, been a very important part of what we do as we own these companies. Um, and that stewardship uh, really begins with um, the G part of ESG. It's around governance. And are these, are these companies uh, being overseen by independent, strong, effective boards? Uh, and it's through that engagement that we've actually broadened out to the other parts of the ESG, E and S. And again, uh, we'd be remiss to say that we know more than any of these companies. But we do believe that we, um, we can look to the boards and see what they're evident, what's the evidence that they're actually doing things for the long term. Because remember, we're the true long term owners, right? We worry about this company for as long as it's going to be around. So uh, that, as stewardship has progressed, as we've gotten better at it, and as importantly, as companies have gotten used to it, in fact, I think there's been a lot of success. Uh, one recent bit of success, I'd rather not name the company, though you're probably going to figure it out uh, during, uh, as, as I tell you about it, was you know, one of the very large oil majors, U.S.-based oil majors. Uh, we've had a long, long stewardship relationship with them. Um, and like a lot of the oil majors, uh, they've been under attack in many different ways. The whole uh, kind of desire for some to divest, uh, many shareholder proposals. 
And they got a shareholder proposal last year, which, um, you know, it, th there were some things ab about it that, you know, maybe wasn't the best written shareholder proposal, but they came to us on it and said, we actually think that we're going to support this. Now, it wasn't the kind of shareholder proposal that an oil and gas company you'd expect was going to, uh, uh, was to support. It had to do with methane disclosures. Uh, it was going to put a lot of burden on this company. Uh, but their view was this, that they do understand the importance of methane uh, and uh, in remediating methane. Uh, they feel that they themselves are doing a lot on this. The board is very proud of the oversight that they're exerting. So even though it wasn't the kind of thing they wanted to do, they did say that you know, given the kind of relationship they have with large shareholders like State Street, and they have a similar relationship with the BlackRock and or Vanguard, I'm sure you know these are large holders that are focused on the long term. And so to me, that's evidence that, that the stewardship is working. Because ultimately, it doesn't help to be confrontational all the time. You need to do it at some points, but ultimately, Management needs to manage companies, boards need to oversee companies, and we need to be there to just you know, move them along in, in a way that, uh, that is useful to the shareholder. So I'm going to jump ahead to a question that really relates to what the example you were just giving, which, which you know, there is a debate in, in the you know, many climate activist communities that people should just get out of these companies entirely, the, the, all the fossil fuels companies. So there's the argument, divest, completely get out of them, and then the capital leaves them, the, the, the responsible capital, some would say. So I'm, I'm curious about your view. Um, what role do you think that these companies really need to play in this transition that we're talking about? Um, how, how do we, you know, what's the best thing? Is it, is it to have this kind of dialogue that you're, you're describing? I mean, divestment is very seductive, right? Um, it's, uh, it, it seems like it's a tool you can say, you know, I showed them, you know, I've, you know, I've vacated my shares, I've sold my shares. Um, for the most part, there's good, I mean, if you sold them, there was a buyer, so nothing really right. changed. Uh, maybe, you know, you made a little money and they didn't make some money. But most importantly now, uh, you have no say in this, right? So you have no ability to influence as an owner uh, what's going on in this company. And as we've seen lots of institutional investors, uh, particularly educational institutions, uh, being pre somewhat pressured to divest, I think in the end we're all worse off. And I think we're really worse off if what happens is you've got a public company that's now going into, that's being taken private. Because, you know, whether we like it or not, the system around most of the world is that public companies have more scrutiny. There's more disclosures, you can see more. So we think that rather than divestment, engagement is actually quite important. Mm -hmm. Second thing I'd add to all this is, you know, I, I know we don't like in many instances, you know, I'll use the oil and gas industry as an example. We don't like where they are. We don't like what's happened. We don't like the amount of time it's taking to do this. Ultimately, the decarbonization is going to have to take place in and amongst the high carbon emitters. Right. So divestment doesn't accomplish anything. In fact, investment may be what's required. It may be. In fact, it's highly likely that many of these companies are going to need more capital to actually get to the decarbonized state that we all desire. What kind of investment? Technologies. Right. So if you th think about some of the, you know, for example, the natural capital discussion that was just here. Natural capital is actually very interesting, but there's going to need to be investments made in that decarbonizing technology. So. Um, as we always, we talk about this a lot, right? The, 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 the path from brown to green, uh, one, is going to take some time, and two, probably has to pass through light brown before it gets to, to green because there's, it's simply not going to get there overnight. What kind of financial instruments um, do you see as being particularly effective for that? Are we, are we talking the world of bonds? What, what, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, so um, it's a really important question because it's... Um, it's not so much as it loans, stocks, and bonds. It's who's where in the capital structure. Um, and this is particularly important as you start to think outside the U.S. Uh, in emerging markets and think about some of the projects that need to take place that are more of a public-private nature. You know, think about, for example, the investments that are required to get out of coal-generating plants uh, in emerging markets and move to renewable technology. Um, there's... Uh, there's probably some capital that needs to be provided that the private sector can't do. It could be political risk capital, could be currency risk. 
So increasingly, there's a lot of discussion going on between uh, private investors and the multilateral development banks. And, and the dialogue that's going on there is rather than the MDBs doing the same kind of thing <clears throat> that the banks or the asset managers can do, can you take that thin slice right at the bottom, mm -hmm. which looks a lot like equity, it's risk that a lot of money managers and certainly pension funds can't take. Uh, if you take that risk all the, off the table, that opens the floodgates to a lot of other uh, capital that can fill the rest of the capital structure. Got it. So I'd like to ask about an organization I mentioned in your introduction. Um, the, uh, your, the, you're spearheading the Asset Managers Task Force for the Sustainable Markets Initiative. So tell us a little bit more. Tell us about the, the initiative and the work that that task force is trying to accomplish. Sure. So the Sustainable Markets Initiative was uh, kicked off by um, Prince Charles and Brian Moynihan of uh, Bank of America in, in January of 2020. And it was meant to be uh, bringing together all industry sectors uh, to achieve this goal. And the reason for making it industry and <clears throat> private sector dominated is because um, you, you've got this need for capital that we've described, but you also got the very industries that need to decarbonize. It quickly then split into various sectors, so-called industry verticals, the transportation companies, the aviation companies, to start to get very granular on some of the solutions uh, generation. Um, shortly after it was kicked off, there was a realization that a lot of the capital is going to come from, or should come, from the asset managers and the asset owners. And asset owners would be things like pension funds, sovereign wealth funds. So that's the task force that I chair. And that work has been around some of the things that I've just described. How do you yeah. put together an attractive kind of capital structure that can bring in this money? You know, how do you bring in, you know, the, say a state pension fund uh, into an investment in an emerging market? Well, you've got to be able to take some of that initial risk off the table. Secondly, was actually to bring those two groups together themselves, right? The asset managers who actually work on behalf of the asset owners and the asset owners that have the capital to, to deploy. <clears throat> and then lastly, <clears throat> this same group has now been working with all these industry verticals elsewhere uh, in the Sustainable Markets Initiative to um, help these industries understand what investors like us are looking for in their path to net zero. So one thing we've talked about here at this conference is cryptocurrency, the, the whole blockchain movement. So what role do you think cryptocurrency will play in the net zero transition? It's a really interesting question because, as I think many of you know, a lot of these cryptocurrencies, and I hope I'm not going to get like spears thrown at me in a moment, um, <laughs> uh, that the, I mean, they themselves are about uh, as uh, carbon generating as any activity out there, you know, the whole mining activity, the amount of electricity it, uh, it consumes. So, you know, leaving that part aside, if, if you think about the role of digital currencies, not necessarily cryptocurrencies, and the importance to bring finance mm. to the rest of the world, I mean, all of us sitting here, we all have a bank account. We don't even know what the, uh, what the term unbanked means. But there's a fair part of the world, by the way, including in this country, that yeah. isn't. And so there's probably a role for these kinds of digital currencies for that. But I think cryptocurrencies, we, we just need a new model there. It just doesn't make sense, at least to me, you know, that we've got to be using this kind of electricity to generate that kind of, uh, to, to, to generate these coins. Well, thank you for following my my securities path here, I'm going to go to the just transition now because we've heard numerous times and we know in our hearts that this transition needs to be just. So we, we saw the chart also um, just a few moments ago. How does your company define just transition? What, what are the things that you're aiming at um, with, with that, that lens? So we think about it in a couple of ways. I mean, uh, for us, it's as simple as given that we're very long term investors over time, a company can't be focused just on shareholders to succeed. I mean, if, if your time frame's a quarter or a year, yeah, maybe you can just focus on doing whatever you can to get that quarterly profit. But over time, um, and, and again, we're long-term investors. We like to see companies thrive and prosper for the long term. How are they doing with their employees? How are they doing with their communities? How are they doing um, in, uh, in terms of complying with uh, their environmental rules and those kinds of things? 
So for us, the just transition is, all about, is, is being uh, completely stakeholder friendly, not just st some stakeholders, but all stakeholders. The second, <coughs> excuse me, the second element to this is, if you think about uh, decarbonization, and if you think about the path to net zero, I would argue that this is the first truly global problem that the world has faced. There is no comparative advantage of the U.S. doing it faster and, you know, India not, right? In the end, carbon's going to be everywhere, and if it's in the atmosphere, if it's being generated anywhere, it's going to affect us all. I mean, even COVID, there was some comparative advantage, I suppose, if you were willing to, you know, hold yourself up in a country, okay, we're going to get the vaccines for ourselves and not share them. This, this journey is not like this. But we also have to remember from an economic perspective that we're not all starting from the same place. And in our mind, it's not just to say to an emerging market that, yeah, we burned down a lot of trees and we burned a lot of coal, we burned a lot of oil to get us to where we are, but you can. Uh, and you need to wait until you have enough money so it's all renewable and have yet another generation or two or three not be able to prosper economically. So for us, the just transition is also about how do we make sure it's fair across countries and across markets? So you are on the council. Um, you are on the advice. You're involved with them. So um, how does that inform uh, your your policies? So translate that to State Street. Yeah. So it, it 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 translates into our stewardship activities. So the stewardship team Did is I focused on this. Again, many of these companies that we invest in, they're global companies. They themselves have assets everywhere and. This is a question we ask them. How are they thinking about the, the geographies they're in and what are they doing to make sure it's just? And internally, um, you've, you're doing a lot to, to help make those decisions <clears throat> be made in that way as well. The 10 actions to address racism and inequality. Tell us about that policy and why you adopted it. Yeah, so this, <clears throat> this was a set of actions that were adopted after the George Floyd killing. And, and for us, it was not enough to be able to talk about it internally. Mm -hmm. We felt we had to make a very, it, it, it's our commitment, but it's a public commitment saying, these are the 10 actions. Here's how we're going to measure ourselves. And you, our stakeholders, need to measure us on this. And we welcome that measurement. And that has just spawned a lot of creativity in our organization, not just around how do we see more representation, but it's even about, I mean, if you think about most large companies, you, know, you spend a portion, of, if you think about your expense base, a portion is on, compensating your people. The rest of it is basically buying stuff from the outside. And we work very hard on that in terms of where do we buy things. And so, and it's not just about, you know, gee, are we, are we, um, are we buying from a catering service that's, you know, that's black or female or veteran owned. We're actually, we're a bank. We issue a lot of securities. So we're working with women owned firms, black owned firms, uh, minority owned firms, to not just issue securities through them, but to make sure that they're learning from us, they're learning from the other issuers that are the under underwriters we work with. So it's those kinds of commitments that we think can just, again, mm -hmm. we ourselves are a long-term company. We've been around for 227 years. I hope that we're around for at least another 227 more. So we heard a lot about the disruption going on. In this. I mean, there's so many things moving and, and um the current macroeconomic conditions uh, are uncertain at best. How is that going to play into this just transition to a, a net zero world? Um, are we moving fast enough? How are you feeling about where we're going? Some, some reflection. So certainly the world has changed a lot in the last year. And if you think about coming out of COVID, <clears throat> we had the vaccines last year. You know, there was a very inspiring gathering in Glasgow, we all felt very good in that this was going to be kind of a straight line to 2050. <clears throat> and then inflation happened, Ukraine, Russia happened. And I think it was just a good reminder to all of us that uh, this is a multi-year, multi-decade journey. Um, and we can have the best plans in the world. We need to do more planning. We need as a society to be starting to bring together decarbonization plans with energy policy. We talk about these as if they're separate things. Um, but it's also a reminder that stuff will happen over time. And that the answer is not to say, well, we can't do this anymore. It's all right, well, given this and given the need to be just, 
and how are we going to figure out energy costs for those that where this is a major portion of their income. We need to figure that out, but we can't take our eyes off the long-term prize. So for me, this was actually in some ways a welcome reminder. It's happened relatively early in the journey, and it's something that I don't know what the next thing is that's going to happen, but the one thing I'm certain is stuff will happen, and we need to be prepared for not to be knocked off the journey, but to say, okay, uh, it's maybe not a straight line. So I always liken it to if you do Google Maps, they're going to map you the straight way there. If you do ways, it kind of looks like this, but you're still going to get there. These are ways journeys, and that's what we need to be prepared for. Well, thank you so much for your leadership. Please thank him for being here with us today. Thank you. Really appreciate thank you. your time.